right, copyright. Can't do that. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Um, we're just getting started here, so apologies for uh, getting rolling. But the, the topic of today's video is did I just improvise or did I not? Now, let's just get right to the chase here at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. But the point of this video is to talk about something that I find very interesting. And it's something that I have always struggled with myself and something that, that is, um, whenever somebody takes this crutch away from you in like an exercise form, it always winds up being like, oh God, what do I do now? And that is essentially, we all have, when we develop an improvisational skill, we all have some sort of autopilot function within our own playing. And that is basically a, uh, a series of, uh, well, we can call it our own vocabulary, our own language that we've developed over time. It consists of phrases, it consists of licks, lines, whatever you want to call it. Little things that we've developed over a period of time that help us stay on track and improvise in a way that, you know, we're playing things, we're calling upon things that we've either heard before or played before, and we're emulating a sound or we're creating sort of, you know, our own sound. But a lot, a lot of times that consists of things that we have developed as players over time. And what that sometimes means is that we have isms, if, if you, you know, if you, if you might call it that. But uh, basically, like, there's a reason that when you listen to Bill Evans, you can hear Bill Evans, you listen to Oscar Peterson, you can hear Oscar Peterson, and just about any great player, whether it's by their sound or by some of the isms in their playing. And that is essentially a form of autopilot in a sense. Now, the fundamental question here, of course, is, is that a problem? Is that bad? Now, I would make the argument, no, that's not bad. It's not bad because everybody has isms. I mean, if you've watched my videos long enough, you probably can hear me say things over and over again that are relatively similar, or I have maybe some ways that I connect sentences together. There's a lot of people that use things like, but, um, you know, things like that, little interjections that help the flow of things from one thing to the next. Now, sometimes those things can become crutches in a sense, and by that I don't mean that they're inherently bad, I just mean that, you know, they're things that we can find ourselves playing over and over again, and we also, we, we, we might get to the point where we actually feel kind of bored, and uh, I don't know, let me know in the chat if you guys have ever seen um, this, because, uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's seen this, I don't mean seen this, sorry, I think I read the word seen in the chat as I was saying that. If you've ever felt this way, if you've ever felt like you were somehow bored or stuck with your playing or your improvisational tendencies, this is something that I have felt a lot. And it's it's basically, you know, you, you, you work out um, a vocabulary usually based on the things we listen to, the things maybe we've transcribed over time, and the things that we utilize on a regular basis when we're playing certain tunes. Now, that tune that I just played um, was definitely not It Could Happen to You for copyright purposes. Not even close. Um, no, it's actually, technically, it's if I don't play the melody, it's fine. You can't copyright a chord progression. It's not really how music works. But uh, that is essentially the same chord changes as It Could Happen to You. Now, that's a tune I've been playing for years. And E flat is a key that I've been playing in for years. And it's one of those things where I have definitely developed my own vocabulary that's based on a lot of things. I mean, many of you who have pretty keen ears can probably hear a lot of Oscar in there because Oscar Peterson was a huge influence for me. Um, and so a lot of those things find their way into my playing and I tend to pull from a lot of the same types of things over and over and over again. Now, why do we do that? Well, because we've established a vocabulary in a style that we sort of look to as, this is kind of how I want to sound. This is. These are some phrases that I've tried before or I've worked out on my own or I've transcribed from somebody else and worked them into my own playing that I like. I like the way that these lines connect one piece of the, of the chart to the next piece of the chart. Whether, you know, if it's somewhere in the harmonic progression in a particular way that you connect chords and you're like, yes, this, I like this connection. Um, sometimes it can, it can utilize a, a particular alteration. Say if you're on a dominant chord, if we're playing, um, there's one. I mean, that's a C dominant, which as it's as a baseline, C dominant would just be right one, three, five, and flat seven. But once we convert it into this more elaborate uh, voicing, we get this chord. And um, this chord here, if you want to take a look at that, the overhead there, um, this is C seven sharp nine flat thirteen. Now. If you look at it closely, you can actually find a couple of shapes in here. 
what we have here is we have essentially this is this is a C7. You might call it a um, you might call it like a like a, a shell. One, three, and flat seven, right? Now uh, on, in my right hand here, I play this. Now that's just a repeated note. So theoretically, we don't need that note. It doesn't need to be there. But on top to get my sharp nine which is E flat, and my flat 13, which is A flat. Take a look at that. That's literally just an A flat chord, just an A flat triad. So if I take the shell and I put that A flat triad over top, boom, there we go. I get C7 sharp nine flat 13. And that's a voicing that I can come back to time and time again because I like the sound of it. Now, I can also build my lines around that. sound as a method to get maybe if it resolves right to an F minor chord that's something there now I added a couple of notes I, I added the flat nine as well right which what would that be filled out I mean, we have this maybe it's that Extra points if anybody knows what, uh, what scale this is. I'll give you I'll give you a hint. It is um, it is a mode of a particular scale. Madav says Phrygian. It's not Phrygian. Dragon the Shark says Locrian. It's not Locrian. C Locrian. Harmonic minor, no. Phrygian, no. Locrian, no. Phrygian, no. Bingo! Piano X small. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Altered scale. The altered scale, yep, there's Tom says altered. Correct. It is the altered scale. Bonus points. Who can tell me what mode of what scale that is? Whoops, no, not that. What mode of what scale? is this altered scale. The nearly Locrian scale. I like that. That's good. Anybody know? Anybody know? Second of the harmonic minor. Not quite. Bingo! Jack S got it. Seventh mode of the melodic minor scale. That's exactly it. Uh, Oet Otom? Otom? Sorry. Um, yes, that is it. That is correct. It is the seventh mode of the, of, the, um, uh, of the melodic minor scale. Now, if we look at our melodic minor scale, start that scale from the seventh mode and just play the same notes. So these notes starting on C. Seventh mode of the harmonic uh, of the melodic minor scale, sorry, seventh mode of the melodic minor scale, which is the altered scale. So that works really well over my and in fact, it, it, okay, check this out. This is pretty cool. So it works really well over this sharp nine flat 13 voicing. But if we're going to use that scale, now we've added those as well. All right, so we have this, and then we also have that. This is what's really cool. Check this out. So you get, when you utilize the entire scale, which is that, you can basically take it apart and say what shapes are inside of this, right? Because we have, fundamentally, we have, oops, we have that A flat major triad I was talking about before. That's within that C altered scale. But then we also have, look at this. We also have, we also have D flat, G flat, and B flat. The G flat major triad in there as well. So we have. A flat major triad and G flat major triad, all which can go over our C dominant shell. So if we have this, we can play. And all of those notes are within that C altered scale. They're within that seventh mode of the melodic minor scale. So it gives us this cool way to kind of play around with the voicings that we're using. If 
devices over top and it helps to simplify things because if you're gonna say, okay, well, let me take this C altered scale and let me play uh, just voicings built out of it. Well, you could do that and you would come up with all kinds of different things, but it's almost a simplification if we look at it and we say, okay, this is just an A flat triad, that's just a G flat triad, and boom, there we go. And those notes are all within the C altered scale, but we don't have to necessarily think about it as some type of, uh, we don't necessarily have to think about it as some type of like super um, uh, just elaborate voicing with all these things. Well, essentially what I said before, which is that, that C uh, seven sharp nine flat 13, right? That's a, that's a mouthful, right? That's what it is, but you could also look at it as, oh, it's just A flat over the C dominant and then G flat over the C dominant. Now, let's see, what, what is this one? Well, now we have, well, that's just our seventh repeated. The, the G flat is our sharp 11, right? And then we also had a D flat in there, which is our flat nine. So we went from sharp nine flat 13 to sharp 11, uh, flat nine sharp 11, right? So C7 sharp nine flat 13. C7 flat 9 sharp 11. Whole bunch of stuff. Basically, the point is this stuff is, is it sounds more complicated than it is, right? Because it's all just a series of, of notes built out of a scale. Because we said, well, it's just the C altered scale. Well, that's easy. If we know it's the C altered scale, then we can just build things out of that, right? So back to the original point about, about developing these lines out of certain things, right? That C altered scale, could I sit there every time I hit the C dominant chord and I know I want to play some type of altered sound within it, whether it's a flat nine sharp, or a sharp, flat nine sharp, oh good lord, flat nine sharp 11 or the uh, sharp nine flat 13, depending on whichever one I want to use, could I just sit there and say, okay, yeah, I'm going to go. You can just play notes. You can develop lines out of that scale, right? Um, but one of the things, for example, that I've played for years and years that I I don't even know where I got it necessarily, but it's one of these things that you develop as a player over time, and that is, right? That line, that's not something that I'm going through and saying, okay, well, it's C altered, and I'm going to develop a line from C altered using the scale, piecing it together bit by bit. No, this is just... For me, that's just something that I've played for so long. I know exactly how it goes. I know exactly where to put it. And it's what you might consider to be a phrase that is within my autopilot vocabulary. Now, the question is, is that improvisation? Well, it depends on your definition of improvisation because you could probably change that definition to make that answer yes or no. If I was to say, well, improvisation is purely uh, making up every single note on the spot, every melody is developed on the spot with absolutely no input from previous things that I've either developed or heard or whatever. Um, if you're going to define that as improvisation, then I guess no, right? I guess maybe it's not necessarily improvisation. However, if you're going to say, well, improv is simply the on-the-spot navigation of a chord sequence, and we all tend to use on-the-spot navigations of conversational pieces in our actual conversation. So for example, somebody says hello to you, you're, you're, you're probably gonna have a set of pretty standard responses that you're going to use depending on the context of that conversation. You're not just going to be like, uh, somebody says hello, and you say 7.30, like that. That's, that's completely out of context. Nobody's ever supposed to be like, what are you talking about? That, I, anyways, so, uh, right? And so we don't do that. Instead, we utilize general functionalities of speech and conversation that we've worked up over a long period of talking to people, right? And we could say that that's within our autopilot vocabulary because we tend to just say things like, oh, I'm pretty good, how are you? Right, which you've probably said a million times, something along those lines. And so, that's an example where it's like, well, was this conversation pre-planned? And the answer, of course, is no, it wasn't pre-planned, but because we have a general vocabulary of phrases and things that are appropriate for the context of any given conversation, we will use those things to navigate conversations smoothly. So 
we could look at improvisation in the same exact manner. Yes, there might be things that are phrases that we've developed over time that you could consider to be autopilot to some degree. However, there is nothing wrong with, with consulting our sort of um, our, our bank of vocabulary that we've developed n to navigate things in, a, in an appropriate context. So when the chord changes call for a particular motion, say it's a flat nine chord resolving to a minor chord, we can do that. That's fine. Right? And so there are contexts in which it is appropriate to pull things out of that bag of vocabulary that you've developed over time. And I don't think that that's, that makes it any less improvisation because you're still making the choice the same way that you would in any conversation. You're still making the choice to say, hey, um, I'm going to say this thing now because it feels like the conversation is pointing in a direction that it would be appropriate to say this. Um, and maybe the answer to that is 730. But it has to be within the context. But you're not necessarily going to pre-plan the conversation. You don't know what the person in front of you is going to say next. They could say anything, right? Um, and so you, gotta, you have to be prepared to respond to those things, and it makes it easier to respond to those things when you do have a vocabulary that is developed. Uh, we have a question here. Are there any particular scales that you'd recommend for jazz practice or improvisation? Uh, particular scales. That's a great question. Uh, and the answer is really yes and no. Now, in particular, I don't know that there's a specific answer. I mean, of course, we have things like the blues scale. <laughs> The problem with that is like sometimes, you know, we get to like a blue scale and it becomes this thing where it's like, oh, now everything you play. Uh. <laughs> Which that in and of itself not particularly interesting, right? So there is a problem, of course, of like, well, yes, it's good to learn these scales, but then we also have to learn how to use them and in what context it's appropriate to stick to them and when we want to move on from them and go do something else. Because, yeah, if we only learn certain things, then it's not going to be particularly useful. However, there are plenty of scales that are very, very useful to learn. I would say, yeah, the blue scale, that's cool, but probably more important, maybe even more useful than the blue scale, learn your modes. And modes, of course, are the different degrees, uh, all the notes from the major scale, starting from different points on the scale. So we start th these, this same, uh, these notes from C, these notes from D, from E, from F, and so on and so forth. And if we make a scale out of all of those, we get our modes. Now, the modes are useful because, of course, you know, we want to be, uh, we want to have options that are not just a major or a minor scale because those don't necessarily always fit the context of the harmonic structure. So modes are, are particularly useful. Now I would say do you need to really focus on uh, Locrian for example? Probably not because it's very rarely used. So if you want the answer to are there particular scales, here's a couple. Ready for this? I would focus on Dorian might be one of the most useful. Dorian, that's the second mode of the major scale. So imagine a C major scale just starting from D, just like that. Okay, now we could say that that is the C major scale, but from D to D, but it's more accurate to say, okay, but what is that? What's going on there, right? And we have, uh, let's call this a D scale in and of itself. Well, let's start with D major. has an F sharp and a C sharp, okay? So um, what did we do to get from here to here? Well, we simply took these two and we moved them down. Well, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? And we took our, th our third and we made it flat, and we took our seventh and made it flat. So we have a flat three flat three, and we have a flat seven, flat seven. That's Dorian, okay? So we have our Dorian scale. Another great one is our Mixolydian scale. And I'm doing all this in the context of C major. So these are all modes of the C major scale. But they, the reason it's good to look at them also as the formula for them, so like flat three and flat seven, that's because um, we, we, we want to be able to pick that scale out anywhere. Now we said it was flat three and flat seven for Dorian. So if we think that, flat three, flat seven, we can start on any note. Let's take F, for example, okay? So let's look at F. 
and we have, there we have F, one, two, there's our flat three, four, five, six, there's our flat seven, one. And that would be F Dorian. That's why we want to think of it as a formula and not just, oh, well, it's a mode of the C major scale. That's not particularly helpful if we want to understand how to find that scale anywhere. So, Mixolydian is another one. Mixolydian, the, the formula for Mixolydian is simply flat seven. So you can take any major scale. Let's take a B flat major scale. And we're saying that the, the, the formula for Mixolydian is flat seven. So when we get to the seventh degree, we're going to make it flat. There's our seventh, let's make it flat. There you go, that's Mixolydian. So that's why it's helpful to know the formula, not just, oh, well, Mixolydian is the fifth mode of the major scale, all that stuff. Yeah, 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 that is what it is. But it's more effective to know it as the formula for how that scale's built, okay? So Dorian, Mixolydian, another great one is Lydian. Lydian is beautiful. Lydian is the fourth mode of the major scale. So if we're in C, that's our fourth, one, two, three, four. So if we play those same notes as C major, just from F to F, we get that. Okay, now that right there, we can say what is the formula for this? Well, in order to find the formula, let's look at this just as an F scale, okay? So what's F major? F major just has one flat, B flat. So we know that we got rid of that B flat. Well, where did it go? It went from there to there. That's how we got F Lydian. Well, that's our fourth degree, and we moved it up sharp boom so we know that f with a sharp four is f lydian now here's what's super cool about lydian lydian is absolutely beautiful and it actually is going to wind up being one of the ones that we use much more often than the major scale itself it's almost like a substitute for the major scale and i'll show you exactly why let's take that f uh lydian scale and let's apply it in a little uh you know chord progression around f we're just gonna go uh we're just gonna go f um one, six, two, five, one, okay? So if we elaborate and we develop, we develop these chords, we develop these, these melodic, or these uh, harmonic structures here, we might end up with something like this. Now, here's the interesting part about F Lydian. So if we look at, when we land on that chord, and we say, how would we turn this into a scale? What would make the most sense here? Now you might say, well, it's a major scale. I mean, it's a major chord, right? So it's F major, so why don't we just use the F major scale? Now watch this. Hmm. It's not bad. It certainly doesn't sound bad at all, but it might seem a little strange, right? It might seem a little bit like, hmm, I wonder how it could be better, right? Let's plug in F Lydian instead. Watch this. just one of those chords, one of those scales rather, that works so well over a major chord. It's just beautiful. For some reason, it's just really, um, it seems like it seats itself very well as a home base. We almost don't need to change anything from that, right? It's just beautiful. And so it's helpful to know those modes because that's one of the things that we're going to use to be able to make these things sound even better, right? And you're not just relegated to whatever, whatever scales, um, you know, they, we happen to know as a baseline. So like we said, uh, Dorian, Mixolydian, Lydian, those are three modes that you're probably going to use, I would say the most. Um, Aeolian, which is also considered natural minor is another one. Uh, all this stuff, you know, um, is, is, 
a really helpful understanding of harmony. We actually have a course about this, by the way. I don't know if you guys know this, but we have a, a Making Sense of Modes course. It kind of goes over all of this stuff on an in-depth level. In fact, check this out. Okay, so we're doing something very special for the live streams, and this is something, because we we've just kind of started doing live streams now. This is what we're doing. Check this out. If you are watching this live stream right now, literally until tomorrow, that's it. This is for all you, all you people who are in the live stream right now, hanging out with me you get 50% off the entire academy. Check this out. So there's a link right, or not a link. Well, there is a link in the description. This is the code right here. So if you go to cornellmusicacademy.com, you plug that code in, all right? So July Livestream 50, if you plug that in, you're gonna get 50% off any of the courses on the academy. That includes the Intro to Piano course, the Making Sense of Modes course, the Intro to Improv course, and our brand new one, Harmony 101, which you guys know was taught by my professor, David De Jesus. He went, he's the director of jazz studies at my alma mater, Purchase College. Um, and uh, he was actually on our last live stream. I don't know if you guys hung out for that, but uh, that was a ton of fun. And Dave put a ton of work into that course and it's super good. But right now, while you guys are in this stream, this code is active. It'll be active for the rest of today. And then tomorrow, it goes away. So stay tuned. If you wanna catch these live streams, we're gonna be doing special things on the live streams like this. Just really, really short-term codes. They're there, they go away. Use this code, 50% off anything on the Academy. There should be two links in the description. One goes to the Intro to Piano page where you can also find the Making Sense of Modes course and the Intro to Improv course. But also there's another link that's slash harmony, cornellmusicacademy.com slash harmony. That goes to the Harmony course. Uh, yeah, 50% off. Check it out. It's uh, it'll, it's good till tomorrow and uh, and that's it. So, and if you miss it, that's okay. Stay tuned. Our next live stream, we'll be doing cool stuff like this every time we stream. Okay, so let's jump into... Um, da -da 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 -da. Ba -ba 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 -ba. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Sorry, one second. One second, one second, one second. Advice for using left hand for bass when improvising. Okay, this is a really interesting topic and it's one that I have struggled with a lot because there's different approaches to it, right? And the approaches are uh, essentially like, well, you can kind of break stuff up rhythmically. You can play just like straight chords. You can play um, some kind of like broken up harmony and things like that. So that works, but also there's another style which is walking bass, which is emulating an upright bass just playing quarter notes, right? That's really hard because you have to essentially be the pianist controlling the melody and the harmony, but then you also have to control that bass line and to keep that going while you are playing, that's a tough thing to do. And it's something that I have never been that great at. Um, it's just something I haven't spent enough time doing to really, you know, to really nail it down. But um, if I, let's see, why don't I play, um, let me play a little bit of something here and um, let's try to, I'll try to give you a little bit of an example of each approach. So uh, you'll kind of hear a couple things. You'll hear some just broken up, like, um, some just broken up chords and a little bit of motion, a little bit of like, you know, moving from one place to the other. And then I'll try to do a, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do a little bit of walking bass. It's, it's tough. There are people who are really, really good at it. Organ players especially, that's something that they seem to really work out and be super good at. Um, so yeah, I'll try to do both. Uh, yeah, let's just see, let's just mess around and see how this goes. Um, let's see.
I forgot about it. All right, check this out. Uh, stride is the other one. Uh, You know, just a couple of different ideas on like how you could actually uh, play in different ways. I didn't really do much walking bass line uh, now that I'm thinking about it, but that's because it's really hard. So uh, it's never been a strong suit of mine. But uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different ways. And I think the biggest thing, because this has always been a struggle for me as well, like how do you keep that left hand going? How do you keep something of interest going to help all of your stuff up top? And I think the biggest thing that I sort of realized at some point is like, don't be afraid to not play right? Like, you don't have to fill all the space. It's, it's okay to leave gaps, and it's okay to create rhythmic things that are maybe answered up here. Like, this doesn't have to be going constantly. It's not a requirement. Like, you can, you can, you know... And that's like, it's not a great example, but the idea is you can be doing stuff up here. You can play a little bit of, you know, rootless voicings as if you were playing with a bass player. And then just every once in a while, you know, come down and fill some stuff in and kind of consider it more of like a passing back and forth thing instead of I have to constantly keep this going down here. That's not a requirement. You can space out your playing. And if you have good time and if you make sure that you cover most of the harmonic uh, things that are kind of required to give to imply the overall harmonic motion that can be really helpful and it can and it can kind of make people hear the whole thing even if you're not necessarily playing or filling up you're playing with a ton of stuff right so don't worry about playing a bazillion notes uh to to keep your left hand going or to think you have to fill out all this harmony and anything like that uh you can you can leave space and that's that's really effective as well Okay, someone mentioned earlier that singing melodies can help with improv. Singing melodies can help with improv. Yes, absolutely. So um, this kind of goes, this kind of brings us back to the original topic, which is this idea of like autopilot. You know, is autopilot really um, a bad thing? And how do you, like, if you want to get off of that autopilot, if you have felt um, stuck or trapped in your playing, like you've been playing the same things, how can you get out of that. And the singing thing is really interesting because there is not really any way that you can sing your uh, your vocabulary on your instrument. I mean, obviously, if you're a wind instrument, this is impossible. But if you play piano or guitar or anything like that, it's difficult to sing because a lot of the things that we have that's sort of within our vocabulary, oh, good Lord, within our vocabulary, can I not say that word? Jeez. A lot of the things that are within our vocabulary, there we go, got it, that are things that we've developed over a long period of time, like what I was showing earlier. Whoa. Right, stuff like that. That's not necessarily something that, obviously I can't sing that, maybe if I was, you know, uh, Jacob Collier or somebody, but that's not something I can sing. 
So naturally, when we sing, we have to rely purely on our ear and our ideas. And it makes it much easier to say, okay, well, I'm going to purely just sing um, off the top of my head as if I were speaking, you know? And that's a different, that's a very different thing. So that, that, essentially, um, that essentially means like, okay, well, you're not going to be able to rely on that autopilot anymore. So now you got to come up with, uh, now you have to come up with purely just stream of consciousness. What would you say if somebody asked you to give a, a speech impromptu and all you had to go on was a general topic or you had some information, in this case, it's like harmonic information and now you have to create something like that. So you'll notice if I, um, if I, if I play, well, let's take that, that, that tune I was just playing. If I take this tune, and I play purely just on, uh, like that, al allowing the autopilot to surface. stuff might come out that's kind of like that or whatever but you know, the other thing uh, that is a maybe a better approach is if I were to take this and I were to say okay well I'm only going to be able to play what I'm singing right it really limits you right and so let me slow the tune down a little bit so I can actually like keep up or something but uh, let's say okay here we go let's see something different in my head. Oh, yeah. It's hard. It's tough. It's, it's, it's difficult to try to separate those thoughts where you're like, okay, what am I, what am I thinking? And then what am I playing? And yeah, you kind of have to like, um, yeah, you, it's, it's, it can be, it can be tough to, to separate those things. Um, do we have a, do we have our, our number one angle? Hey, there we go. Cool. Um, yeah. So, this, uh, sound, sound of your playing style. Blah blah blah. blah. Hate the sound of your playing style, uh, Lucas. This is exactly what I'm talking about, actually. And this is the thing th that can sometimes be difficult. So there are literally some things that I just sang that I would not have played that I liked better than my playing. There were a couple things in there that I thought just sounded better. They're more melodic. They're more singable. They're more sounding like they're a melody from another tune rather than just improvisation. So that often is like a way that uh, that you can break out of that. 
right? So the singing thing is really is is a really good um, a really good idea, and it can help you break out of that uh, that trap that sometimes we can create for ourselves when we're just improvising using our autopilot function. So yeah, that exercise you're gonna try it. I don't do it very often, so it doesn't sound that great, and that's what's gonna happen for you if you don't do this. It's not gonna sound very good, but it's a really great exercise. So I highly recommend if you sing along to your own playing, that can really help you break out of this shell. Um, Got a couple, uh, Discus Tangy, thank you so much for the super chat. Still waiting for the Cardi B collab. I know, dude, same thing. Um, me too, actually not really. <laughs> that's, that's uh, yeah, oh man, that was, it's crazy. It's, we've done so much since then. It almost feels like a totally different chapter, you know, back when I was first starting out. Um, Smithelwerb, I can't, is that how that is? Thank you so much for the super chat. What are your favorite ways to modulate a major key up a fifth? I always find myself using a one, five, two, which feels uninspired. I may need you to elaborate on that a little bit. So to modulate a major key up a fifth. So what I'm assuming is we're going from here and we're going to, we're going to G. So we're starting in C major and we're going to G major. And you find yourself using a one, five, two to get to the fifth? One, one, five, two to get to the fifth. Okay. so. Does that mean from the key we started in? So for example, so let's just establish. All right, so we're in this and we're gonna modulate, we wanna get to G major. So it sounds like what you're saying is, we gotta go one, five, two. Oh, they were all major. They were all major. Hold on. So one, five. Okay, well, you've got the last part definitely right if this is what you're talking about, right? So if we're saying, okay, we're gonna go from our two to that five, to that five chord, which we're calling our new home base, right? Because we're modulating to it. Then that's theoretically all you need. Because here's the secret about modulations. You can set up any key change or modulation you want with a five. That's all you need. I can literally be playing. Um, let me just play a little bit and see. Somebody pick a key. What key should I go into? So like, um, piano player, two, five, one. I will explain it in just a second. Somebody pick a key, pick a key. What am I gonna go to? From C, something weird. Something that doesn't, that doesn't typically. C to C. <laughs> to F, to, okay, G flat, that's a good one, because that's a tritone, oh boy, here we go. That's a tritone, so I like that one. We got some good examples, we'll do a couple of them. E flat, A flat I saw, B, all right. First, let's go to G flat. Wait, 
So the trick with modulations is literally just just put a five in front of it. Now in that case, I was put all, all of my fives happened to be uh, sus thirteen chords. So you could do it however you want, but I mean, so transition to Q sharp. Uh, no, um, <laughs> but yeah. So like you know. There's just so many easy ways to change from keys. Now, if you want to go one step further, you can throw a two in front of that to make a two five one. Now, we're moving on to this next question that was, what is a two five one? Very simply, when we're talking about numbers in music, we're referring to the scale that is our home base for the key, whatever key we're in. So for example, we started that just now, we were in C major. So when we look at the notes of C major, we give those notes numbers, and the chords that we build off of those notes we just call them the numbered chords. So for example, that's just one, right? Because it's the root, it's the start of our chord, it's the first note of the chord, and that is the chord we're building. We call that the one chord, okay? If we start and build a chord from the second degree, we call that the two, right? And that's minor because we're using the notes that are that are within that scale, right? So we're gonna build our chords out of those notes. Okay? So Every chord has a naturally occurring quality to it. Our one is major, our two is minor, our three is minor, our four is major, our five is major, our six is minor, our seven is diminished, and then that brings us back to our one chord, right? So when we're talking about chord progressions, we do the same exact thing. We refer to the numbers within the scale, okay? So when we say a two, five, one, this is very, very simple. We're simply saying that we're playing the chord that starts on the two, then the chord that starts on the five, and then the chord that starts on the one. That sounds like this. Now you'll notice something about hearing that just now. Let me play it one more time. Boom. That sounds complete. It sounds like an ending, right? So it gives this sort of like, hey, we're done. This is, a, this is an adequate resolution to that harmonic motion. And that is why the 251 is one of the most common sounds in music, particularly in jazz. Uh, and so that, that movement at its very basis, just using triad sounds exactly like that. Now we can expand that and we can create all kinds of sounds, eventually getting to things that sound like this. to that. So we have a two, a five. Now let's build the chord on the three, and then the six, and brings us back to two, five, one. These are beautiful harmonic motions that we can do all kinds of things with. We can develop these chords into whatever we want and do all sorts of interesting things with them by adding color tones on top of them, adding alterations, getting crunchy things like that, right? And we can do all sorts of cool stuff to make that 251 sound great. Now, to go back to, we're gonna blend these two questions together. What is a 251? That's a 251. How do you modulate to literally any key you want? You use a 251 into the new key. So we're in C major. Now you, you heard, like, uh, so let's go to E flat, and we can just do, we can just do a five, or we can do a two, five, one. So we're in here. It fits perfectly. Nothing sounds like it's dropping out of nowhere. Nothing sounds like it's out of place. It's just like, boom, there we are. It's a beautiful, sensible transition that leads our ear in the correct direction and we go oh yeah that sounds right that sounds good i like that cool let's do something weirder let's go from c to i don't know let's go to let's let's do a tritone away let's go to g flat so we're gonna go Sharp. That's 
key and then a 5-1 in the new key? That's a great question, piano player. So the answer is it's a 2-5-1 in the new key. So if we didn't, if we tried to refer to it specifically as like the key that we're in, when we start, which in this case we're calling C, we try to say, okay, what actually is that uh, somewhere else? So like, um, if we were gonna go to, what was the, what was the one we went? Uh, let, let's take E flat, for example. If we were gonna say, if we're gonna refer to those chords in the context of C major, it would be weird. It'd be four minor, flat seven, minor three, but a major chord. That's why like, it's kind of just, it's kind of just a modulation altogether. So we're just saying, this is one if we were in C major, but we're gonna go to E flat major. So we're gonna call that, this is in the key of E flat, one, two, there's our two, three, four, five, there's our five, and then of course one is E flat. So we have F, B flat, and, and E flat is our two, five, one, right? So if we're in C, we're gonna say a two, five, one, two, E flat, two, five, one. All three of those chords we're referring to in the key we're going to. So that's why when we say, oh, then a two, five, one to blah, 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 right? That's just saying, New new key, new chords. We're referring to them in their in their new their new thing. Um, I saw a question um, that said that asked, "What does the course teach?" So this is a great question, and the answer is that there are multiple different courses. And once again, in case you guys missed it, or if you're just coming in now, there is a very special thing we're doing for the live stream only. If you guys are in here right now, you're going to see this. Get ready. Bang, here it is. This is a code that you can use to get 50% off literally anything on the Academy. Now to answer your question, we have an intro to piano chords. If you're just starting out, it's a great place to start. It's, um, it's a ton of videos and practices and all, all types of things that you can use to kind of just get started on this instrument. And then we also have an intro to improvisation. If you've ever been interested in taking the piano skills you are developing and starting to learn how to play whatever you want on the spot, that is where you want to start. Intro to improv, that's another one. We also have making sense of modes. Some of the mode stuff that we've been talking about so far in this live stream is we have a whole course about it. What are modes? How do you define them? How do you use them? When are they appropriate to be used? That's all in the Making Sense of Modes course. And then most recently, we just put out a brand new course called Harmony 101. If you want to get started with understanding harmony, understanding chords, understanding how to harmonize a single note, how to create all types of different harmony, that's what that course is all about. And it's taught by one of my professors, one of the guys who taught me everything I know. He's the director of jazz studies at my alma mater, Purchase College. His name's David Jesus, and he did a killer job putting this course together. So you guys are interested in any of that stuff, there's links in the description. Description, um, CornellMusicAcademy.com will bring you, there's also a link on that page to the Intro to Improv course and the Making Sense of Modes course. Also, there's a link to the CornellMusicAcademy.com slash Harmony for the Harmony 101 course. All of it, 50% off, use this. It's only good until tomorrow. You guys are receiving the benefit of coming to hang out with me, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That is literally hands down the best way you guys can support the channel because as you may know, the YouTube system with copyright stuff is fun to say the least. So yeah, um, it's really difficult for us to make the content that we make and be able to to build any like ad revenue on it. We really can't because it's all claimed by people who um, just want to make free money off of other people's creations. Yeah, so that's fun. Anyways, if you want to support the channel, that's the best way you can do it. 50% off now through tomorrow. And uh, if you happen to miss out on this one or if you're not you're not ready to pick something up yet, Stay tuned because when we do live streams, we're probably gonna do something like this. Okay, so that's that. Um, any advice on getting beyond the blue scale when improvising? So that is kind of uh, a lot of what we were talking about with um, the modes, understanding different scales, and then also understanding like every chord is a scale. This is the crazy part. Like every single chord is literally a scale just with some of the notes taken out, okay? Check this out, right? If we take a C major seven, just very simple, a C major seven chord. One, three, five, seven. Boom, okay? Well, the, yeah, that's a C major seven chord, but what that really is, is a C something scale with some of the notes taken out, right? Now, we might say, okay, well maybe this is C Lydian, okay? How would we fill this in to create C Lydian? Well, we'd fill that in, we'd fill that in we know that our C Lydian is a sharp four, so that it would not be a natural four, it would be sharp four. Now, what can we do with this? Well, watch this. If we take this basic thing, we know that the remaining notes are D, F sharp, and 
A. Well, let's just throw those up on top. D, F sharp, A. There is our C major 13 sharp 11, whatever you want to call it, right? That chord is beautiful. So when you ask the question, how do we get away from just using the blues scale when improvising, the answer is take a look at chords. Take a look at all the different chords that you are playing because the answer is all of those chords are scales, just with some of the notes removed. So if you can figure out what the scale is, you immediately open yourself up with all these other options on things to play, right? Because now, instead of just having just the blues scale to mess with, now you have Right? All this... All this other stuff to play with that's purely just based on the scale that we just defined. The scale that we defined by looking at the chord and saying, if we filled the rest of this in, what would it sound like? Right? Um, let's see... How do you make good voicings? That's a great question, and that's kind of what we're talking about right here, right? Because we're saying... Fill, fill the chord in with a scale and then use that scale to build other voicings. Because when we say that is our scale, C Lydia, well, normally we build chords as stacked thirds. Right? Uh, I've seen a couple people ask, is, is this being recorded? Yes, this is going to be just a regular video in my feed. You can come back to it whenever you want. Um, so... What if we didn't want to do stacked thirds? What if we wanted to make this more interesting? Because we know we're just using this, right? So let's then take those notes and just spread them out all over the place. I don't even know what I just did. Ooh, ah, sharp 15. Um, okay. All of that right there, li literally, this is this is just C Lydian C major seven with a sharp eleven. It's just the Lydian scale spread out into a whole thing. Well, not that. You do all kinds of stuff. You can literally spread that scale out across the entire piano if you wanted to. There are no limits to what your voicings can be. But the answer to how do you create better voicings is define the scale that it actually comes from. Because uh, once again, all chords are simply just scales with some of the notes dropped out, right? So if you define whatever that scale is, then you can redistribute all the notes of the scale to create whatever voicing you want. What's, what's something that, rather than playing all over the piano, what's something we could actually do with that C major 7 sharp 11? Let's do this. Yeah, sure, why not? Or, let's do... Sure, that's, that's literally like all the notes of the scale right there. Check that out. All the notes of the scale. One, six, three, five, two, sharp 11, or four, seven. That's it, that's, that's all seven notes. There you go, okay? So, yeah, I mean, it's that's it's kind of it. Like, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to mess around with making fancy voicings and things that you don't normally play. You literally just have to say, what's the scale? And then redistribute the notes however you want to, based on that. Uh, how do you incorporate a backdoor 251? First of all, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, this is an interesting question. So for those of you who don't know, a backdoor 2-5 simply, simply refers to as, it's a 2-5 that, that uh, okay, so I guess more accurately, it would be a 2-5, not a 2-5-1, because the 2-5 is in a different key. Here's what I mean. If we wanted to do a backdoor 2-5 into C, Okay, so let's just, you know, let's establish C in our ears as home base. Okay, so now we're all hearing in C, ready? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are going to do a two five where the, where the, the five is one whole step below C. That's obviously B flat. So B flat needs to be our five. So what's the two of that then? Well, it's F right? Because if B flat is the five, then that means the key is E flat, right? And our two would be F. So we're going to go 
Woo! Listen to that, right? Check that out, okay? So this is a backdoor 2-5. We go 2, 5, and where we land on the 5 is a whole step below where we're going to resolve back to our 1. All right, so let's play that a little bit in context. Check that out. Oh, what a beautiful sound, right? It's gorgeous. It's such a pretty sound. Uh, and that is what a 251 is. Oh, somebody said. Somebody said the code is not. Somebody said the code is not working. Did anybody else try that? Um, the co you apply. Do you apply it into the coupon box when checking out? Yes. So when you click on the checkout, the um, you sh there there should be apply code, and if you put uh, July live stream fifty, it should work. Um, but but def please let me know if that's if that's not. Please let me know if that's not working, because um, we'll fix it immediately. I have many apologies for that if you're having trouble. Any advice on, uh, thank you, Schnebs, first of all. Any advice on avoiding over overusing sustain pedal in playing? Ah, this is such a great question. This is something, uh, I tried it, it worked. Okay, thank you. So maybe try it again. Somebody else tried it and they said it worked. It should work, it should be fine. Um, but just, yeah, hit the apply code button, put it in. For those of you who are just tuning in, uh, July uh, live stream 50, uh, it will, it's uh, fifty percent off anything on the anything anything we have intro to piano intro to improv making sense of modes and our brand new harmony one one course just for you guys in the stream right now that code's gonna go away tomorrow so if you want to use it fifty percent off there's the code right there um, yeah give it a shot anyways there's a great question here about pedals this is something oh my god this is such a I'm so glad you asked this question this is something that there was one thing that got told to me that just solved all my problems and I was like whoa right and it was exactly this when you are playing. By the way, this might be obvious to some people, but to whoever asked this question, and for me, this was not obvious. So apologies if this is common sense to you, but this helped me so much when somebody told me this. Pedals. The reason you're using too much pedal is because you don't inherently understand how to think about when to release the pedal. Here's how to understand. When you release the pedal is precisely the moment you play the next thing. Right? So, uh, I wish I had a foot cam. That would be cool. Um, then I would sell my feet pics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you have, uh, you, you have one, and then you have uh, another chord, right? So, you're playing the one chord, and then you lift the pedal as soon as you play the next notes. Um, and then, boom, right there, boom, right? So the second my fingers depress the next chord of the next note, you lift the pedal right then. And that, that to me was, because I was, I was thinking of it as like, well, I don't want to drag the pedal over the next thing. So I'm like, okay, uh, let me pick it up and then press it as I'm playing the notes. So it's like, press, up, press up press that's not right that's wrong because now we're creating a gap right we what we want is you can press it anytime you're holding the notes right right so i'm holding the pedal right it's still down and then watch this up and then down again here we go ready up and then down again ready up and then down again and all it does is that just speeds up if you're playing quicker so it's holding down now that's doing is it's allowing all the notes to connect to each other correctly without allowing them to bleed over each other because if I just hold it that's not gonna work right so you want to have that up down up down and the up 
when you release the pedal is when the next thing gets played that you want to stop the resonance from the previous thing. Okay, that changed my whole outlook on pedaling. And once I figured that out, I was like, oh, and that fixed all my problems. And so I would definitely look at it like that. Um, it's like doing a counterpoint to your playing, but with your feet, kind of. Um, we can't pay attention after the feet fix joke. I mean, if you guys want them, I don't know. How do you use tritone substitutions or uh, other types of stuff? Oh my God, you guys, these questions are so good. I, I don't know, oh my, I've already been going for over an hour. We kind of, uh, Oh, okay, I'm gonna answer this one. Uh, this is the last one. By the way, don't forget, 50% off right now through tomorrow. That's it, that's all the time you have. July live stream 50. Um, use it, anything on the Academy is 50% off with that code. And if you are watching this video and you weren't here for the live stream and it's more than, well, the day after this live stream posted, Sorry, tune into the next one. There'll be something there, I'm sure. Um, anyways, okay, substitute, tritone substitutions. This is another one. This is exciting because to me, this was another one where I was like, oh, I finally understood what they were because I always heard tritone sub, tritone sub, tritone sub. And it was always just like, it was like, oh, okay, I kind of get it, but what's the, this is the purpose. You ready for this? The entire purpose of tritone substitutions, chromatic movement. Watch this. <laughs> by itself probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but here's what I'm doing there. A tritone sub replaces the five chord. Let's play a two, five, one. Okay, two, five, one. The tritone sub is going to replace our five. With what? Well, it's a tritone sub. So how about let's replace it with its tritone. What's a tritone of F? It's B, right? So we're gonna go, and instead of going, we're gonna go there. Now notice what that just did. It created a chromatic movement in the root. C to B to B flat. Now, here's what's super cool about this, because when we look at the chords that we use, this is what's brilliant. We have our two chord, and then we go to our five, but watch what happens. If I just go. That literal same voicing still works. It still works, even with the tritone substituted out, right? It's a little crunchy because it contains some alterations. We have a, uh, we have, what do we have here? We have a sharp, uh, no, wait, what? What is this? Yeah, we have a sharp 11, flat 13, flat nine. Flat nine, sharp 11, flat 13. Um, but it works, technically. So that's what's beautiful about the tritone sub is it's basically the same chord. It's pretty much the exact same thing. You're just changing the root note so that the root now follows a chromatic motion, which gives us this nice little. Check that out. Listen to the difference. Versus. They're almost identical, but the difference is that the root now has given us this nice opportunity to just flow chromatically. So we can approach the chord we're going to with what you might call an approach chord. Maybe I'll step up. Beautiful, right? And it's very, very simple. It's literally just the five chord changed out for its tritone, that's all. We have the five, and instead of the five one, we're gonna do flat two, one, because that's the tritone of the five. So you can just create, if you wanted to do, I'm just doing five ones down in whole steps. Right? And I can replace all those fives with just a chromatic note. Right? Watch this. Uh, uh, where am I going? Where am I going? Wait, wait, wait. Shit, um, there it is. Woohoo! Oh god. Oh god. No, I don't know. Anyways, but that's what it is. What would be the next one? Oh, no, that's not it. 
Anyways. Yeah. Please, in a YouTube video, we listen to Ratatouille's soundtrack. Boy, do we have a surprise for you! Stay tuned. Filming now. Coming to a theaters near you. Coming to YouTube for free. Please buy our courses. <laughs> everything we play, everything we make gets claimed. <laughs> um, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so yeah. Um, feet picks incoming. Everybody stay tuned for that. So yeah, 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 what? Right, we are doing Ratatouille. I promise, it's happening. Feet picks, maybe, maybe not. It's kind of up in the air, but feet, um, you know. Ratatouille, let's 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 definitely do that. Cool guys, I gotta go. Holy crap, this has been a long time. This has been super fun. Uh, love hanging out with you. You guys are great. Uh, oh my god, Victor, thank you so much. Oh my god, you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, um, oh god, I'm trying to read hugs from Brazil. Oh, Brazil, thank you. I'm so happy that video worked. It didn't at first. The algorithm had no idea who to serve it to. It was just like, oh god, I don't. Hey, oh, oh my god, I'm literally forgetting everything. I'm so sorry. Brand new episode with you guys know about this anomaly. If you guys don't know who Anomaly is, he is, oh my god, he's so great. He's one of my favorite musicians, and we just had him on the podcast. The brand new podcast, there's a link in the description, the Odd Time Podcast. If you haven't checked it out, we're having an absolute blast. And he was our first guest ever. Nico is, goes, goes by Anomaly. You guys probably know him. Anomaly Beats on Instagram and YouTube. Incredible, incredible musician. Amazing piano player. We had such a fun time talking to him. It's like a two hour long podcast. You can get it anywhere you get your podcast, but if you would, subscribe to the YouTube channel because that really helps us get it off the ground. I really appreciate that. Anomaly was awesome. He was such a great guest. What a great dude. I love that dude so much. Um, and his, his playing is just astoundingly amazing. So please go check out that episode. We had such a blast making it. Uh, and we will see you in the next video. And definitely in the next live stream. 50% off, July live stream 50. Use it before it goes away. And I love you all. We will see you next time.